Next. Hey man, let me ask you something. Somebody draws something and then you draw the exact same thing like right on top of it without going outside the original designated art. What do you call it? I don't know, man. Tracing? <laughs> See? Movie originality and movie tributes. And the line between the two are a morally gray area in film history, as it seems the best filmmakers steal their movie ideas from their influences naturally. And it's so commonplace that we don't notice it anymore. Go home. Go. Paul Schrader's first reformed is blatantly based on Ingmar Bergman's Winter Light. And to his surprise, when he was doing a press tour of the film, only a few movie critics mentioned his blatant revision of Bergman's film. I was pregnant. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks. He, he thinks it's wrong to bring a child into this world. Brian De Palma made a slew of films based on Alfred Hitchcock's best hits as well as using Hitchcock's stylistic approach to thrillers and horror film hybrids. The most blatant homages are seen in the Hollywood system, or idea stealing if you want to call it that, as many of the big blockbuster trendsetters establish, as seen in the latest genre trend in superhero films. Before this it was westerns. Everybody. Akira Kurosawa influences can be seen everywhere. Catch you following me, begging for help, because you won't get it. It's easy to say originality was dead a long time ago before the end of the silent era. It's a fake. Empire State Photographic Department confirms it. Pack your things. Get out of my building. I was just You're fired! What does it mean to steal ideas? David Lynch in his masterclass lessons on directing supposed in making anything you should start with an idea. Then you should continue with 78 ideas all stacked up in scenes and there you have a movie. When is it okay to borrow? I guess it depends on uh, borrowing or stealing. <laughs> and um, so in Wild at Heart, Sailor and Lula it just started creeping in that they just loved The Wizard of Oz and would make references to it. Stealing, I guess, but it made sense to the characters and it, in my mind, it, it honors this great film, The Wizard of Oz. When you take that philosophy and apply it to Quentin Tarantino, you realize his ideas stack upon each other from a deep and informed knowledge of film history. His work is at allegiance with plagiarism. What do they call a Big Mac? Big Mac's a Big Mac, but they call it Le Big Mac. A Le Big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Telling you he would have never ripped us if it wasn't for that day. The first time I saw her, I knew she was trouble. Jesus Christ, man. What are we doing fooling around out here in the middle of the desert for? But it's not that simple. It goes deeper. Allow me to explain how you should steal movie ideas for the betterment of cinema. Out of all of Tarantino's films, all his scenes and his recurring collaborations, even his ninth film's tour of his specific nostalgic idea of his Rosetta Stone or the origin of his brand of movies. You don't know. Me and, me and three Georges. Which three Georges? Papard, Maharis, and Shakaris. Oh, man. Yeah. That's gotta hurt. Of all of these, my favorite thing about Tarantino's films is the moment when, much like the Coen brothers, he went against the conventions with his second or specifically his third film and went all the way to the end of his career. And the thing is, that's totally fine because I knew exactly what I was doing. I would like it though if the critics who don't like it because they think it's too long. All right, what I'd like is at least give me the credit for like not making a mistake. I meant to do that. All right, you know, I meant the movie you saw. I believe Tarantino intentionally made Jackie Brown as if it was his last movie, his 10th movie, by pacing it and making it as if he had made it right now. And Once Upon a Time in Hollywood solidifies this theory as one of Quentin Tarantino's last films. It shares a lot in common with Jackie Brown and Pace, characterization-based narrative and its pressure cooker ending. In between these two films are his trademarks. Like a highlight reel of career bests. Like an enclosed space. Heist movie without no actual heist. In Reservoir Dogs, created a film that should have ruined him. He should have been known as the guy who made Pulp Fiction for the rest of his life but he somehow had this time machine. Or his gift as he would call it. And with this gift he made sure his next film would be his underrated masterpiece. 
Well, I think I'll just go see for myself. This film is totally unique and it feels as we now have nearly finished his filmography as if it was his last film that could fit at the end before he was there. Like the circle narrative Pulp Fiction had, he curated his filmography by interwinding them all. Like his two-volume epic. <laughs> A grindhouse double bill and a recurring motif. Both Reservoir Dogs for example and Hateful Eight are films he was close to not making. And both have the same The Thing inspired plot where one of the characters who are trapped by the heat and the blizzard are not who they say they are. And the identical endings in both films where both characters are soaked in blood as they reach their comeuppance with no prospects of the characters surviving when the credits roll. Hey. <laughs> Can I see that Lincoln there? The main characters are motivated by a main lie with very subtle absentee father subtext playing into it that Tarantino himself revealed. My favorite Tarantino flick is Jackie Brown, possibly his best film although it's not that obvious, simply because it's clearly not meant to be his third film. It was played at the time, confusingly like a swan song. And not just for Pam Grayer, or its focus on a twilight romance. It too is a clear adaptation unlike his other films that originally come from lots of other movies. Is that what I think it is? What do you think it is? I think it's a gun pressed up against my dick. <laughs> well, you thought right. While the basement scene in Inglorious is his best work, Jackie is his best film because it clearly comes from a different director. A maturity he soon left behind for Kill Bill exploitation and spaghetti western era he went through only to just now move back into the spaces and places of such a sensible film that ends with a suspense exercise that tests how far it can go. Only focusing on his underutilized tools for suspense and misdirection until Quentin Tarantino exploits his trademarks with the toolbox of scenarios Tarantino has in his gallery of film knowledge and references. Brown has a classic money in the bag scenario. That is still slick and perfectly exacted when you rewatch it today with that dark morose sense of humor. What the f happened to you, man? Your ass used to be beautiful. And Once Upon a Time in Hollywood has the same. <laughs> Both Jackie Brown and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood are almost identically paced as we hang out with characters for the majority of the runtime as the eventual story engages within the last chapter. And it's all leading to this collision of all the film's hangout movie moments. That was only teased before in the ranch scene almost like a near miss before the figurative clash of characters at the end of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm really trying to pace a film differently than the average cinema is made. And that feeling is truly getting to hang out with the characters, I mean like hang out with them, where they're not like movie yeah. characters, or they're being introduced in a movie kind of way. I mean, um, like the, the movie's two and a half hours long. The first hour of the movie is just getting to know who these people are. The I mean, first it's, hour. The first hour is just living with them. I attempted to just really dive into characterization, and I think that time I spent with the characters is what makes the end scene work. Is everybody okay? Well, the hippies aren't. That, that's for goddamn sure. If you don't see it now, Jackie Brown is issued after Tarantino's specific plan. His films all have a place. But he's released the non-linearly like the cursed blessing that got him the Palme d'Or. He has an idealistic portfolio for his future legacy. And using his time machine mind he assured there will be a protege who will watch them and see a career best set of films that complement each and connects what is at first and mysterious suitcase. A one-room narrative. Twin plot devices that all hold all these separate stories together. Now I'm carrying the weed around in one of those carry-on bags. Take all this cash. I want you to put it in this Billingsley shopping bag. How did you get out? I shot my way out. I started shooting, so I blasted my way out of there. You overthink this idea, you begin to see Pulp as the roadmap to Tarantino's films as each chapter somehow echoes his future films with the failed pilot episode and Kill Bill. Five, then there's one, two, three, four, five of us. There was a blonde one, Somerset O'Neill. She was a leader. The Japanese fox was a kung fu master. The black girl was a demolition expert. French fox's speciality was sex. What was your specialty? Knives. 
the same way he nudges movie references. You begin you realize how meticulous Tarantino is about his own movies, and you can not help but wonder if like Pulp Fiction's final chapter won't be a symmetrical narrative and it won't fold in on itself with his reservoir dogs and cohesively bind all ten films into their own ten chapter binder. Now that would be a cool trick. Silly rabbit. Tricks are for kids.